Um, thank you everyone for coming today. It's uh, such a strange time for all of us and I'm really glad that uh, those of you who joined us are able to make time and to come together as ELPS one more time during the semester for our final R3 series. Uh, we've never done one of these entirely online before. Um, so the way that we're going to, to work it today is that um, we're going to try to keep everyone on mute during the presentation uh, and also during the Q&A and encourage you to type any questions that you have for Dr. Yoon into the chat feature. Mm -hmm. We'll moderate and screen those questions and uh, that's how we'll do the Q&A period. Um, so without further ado, we are lucky to have with us today Dr. Anhee Yoon, who is an assistant professor in the Counselor Education Program in EPLS. Dr. Yoon is an active member of the Association for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Issues and Counseling and was named an emerging leader in 2017-18 of the ALGBTIC for her service to the LGBTQ plus community and her clinical and scholarly activities. She served as an editorial board member of the Journal of LGBT Issues and Counseling since 2016 and has given invited lectures and workshops related to LGBTQ AIQ plus counseling competencies at state, national, and international conferences and universities. Before coming to FSU, she worked for Seattle Pacific University and the University of Florida's, Florida's Medical School. And she also obtained her PhD from UF, so she is originally a Gator. Uh, welcome <laughs> and thank you for joining us today. <laughs> welcome anyway, despite being a Gator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the awesome introduction and uh, thank you for having me here. I was a gator, but at the, at right now I think I'm pursuing the uh, dual identity as a gator and a gnome. <laughs> so, um, hi guys, if you don't mind, I mean, could you uh, turn on the videos? I just wish I could uh, see your face if you don't mind. Hi guys. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, hey. Because uh, I'm a counselor, so I mean, I'm more used to I mean, see people's facial expressions and their eyes. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, just, I'm just more com I mean, comfortable to see people's face. Thank you, thank you for uh, turning on your videos. How are you doing? Hi, I mean, how are you guys dealing with this uh, situation? Could be stressful. How you guys are reorganize your daily life nowadays? Did somebody just not just, just hanging in there, maybe? Trying to survive? Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for yeah, showing your um, non-verbal message. I do hope uh, you are doing well enough. Doing well enough. Uh, today, I, by the way, I have another monitor here. So when I see uh, this direction doesn't mean that I'm kind of distracted or something. Uh, thank you for your understanding. So uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see these slides? Yay. Yeah. Oh, Dr. May is here. You already, <laughs> actually, I mean, I presented uh, the similar uh, materials uh, when I interviewed last year, and Dr. May was here, was there. So I hope it's not being redundant for her. <laughs> okay, so today uh, we'll talk about like how to support transgender, gender non-conforming, expensive students in K-12. So, is any of you as uh, familiar with this flag? This pretty uh, sky blue, pink, and white flags? Some of you is familiar, maybe not for some of you. 
Uh, this flag is, is a pride flag for the uh, transgender people and transgender and non complaining expensive people. So uh, like uh, 10 years ago, we didn't have um, many other terms. But now we have like uh, more terms uh, related to the gender minorities. But still, uh, transgender, the term transgender could be used as an umbrella term for the uh, all gender minorities, by the way. So it was started from the uh, pride flag for the transgender people, but nowadays it could be uh, like representative of transgender and non conforming and expensive uh, individuals. Next slide. Yay. Could you a little bit share what makes you come here? If you don't mind. Were you interested in transgender, gender non from expensive students? Um, I am, I was a sponsor for a gay straight alliance at my schools where I've taught for the last 10 years. And uh, in particular, it was through a request by some students who identified as transgender that we even started the first club that I was a part of. And so it became a really important part of my pedagogy as well um, after forming the club and becoming familiar more with some of the uh, issues of advocacy that were desperately needed in this field. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Any other? Uh, yeah, for me, I'm a student teacher, so I'm doing my internship right now. And I have a transgender student and she has really come to me like with stuff that she's struggling with back at home with her parents not agreeing and um, I've just I'm trying to figure out like how I can help the student the best. Wow, thank you for sharing and thank you both for being a um, support system for those students. Any other? Um, My focus hi. Is in, oh, you can go ahead. Okay, um, hi, I'm also um, in the K-12 system and I mm -hmm. want to be able to advocate for all of my students in the best way possible. And um, in order to do that, I have to be able to educate myself on it so that I can. Thank you, thank you. So I'm in the higher education program. So my interest really looks at what policies um, around inclusion and best practices K through 12 then kind of complement mm -hmm. or contradictory to some of those policies in higher education. And I also work um, at our health and wellness center. So we work a lot with trans students and helping them navigate those systems. And so it's just a population that I'm passionate about and making sure that I am being an ally in their experience as opposed to a roadblock. Thank you. Yes, we need more. Actually, we need to develop more policies, especially for this, uh, for the schools. Any other? Thank you very much for uh, your inputs. I'm so glad to hear, I mean, many of you already being a support system for the transgender gender non-conforming students, and you are interested in uh, advocate for the marginalized population. You guys are doing beautiful, beautiful job. Thank you so much. So let's talk about vocabulary a little bit. I guess maybe some of you already um, familiar with like lots of vocabularies related to PGNC issues. And I bet I mean, you guys are more expert in English than I am. But let me, let me explain a little uh, bit about some vocabularies. So when we say about, when, when you're saying about uh, sex, usually uh, it uh, means like a assigned sex. So why it is like called the assigned sex? So when you're born, I believe many of you are nowadays born in the hospital, maybe most of you were born in the hospital. When you're born, a medical doctor assigns you between male and female, right? So they're checking your, uh, usually they are checking your uh, physical uh, bodies and your appearance and then and then they assign you between male and female, right? To the spinal system. What about intersex? 
Are you guys familiar with the term uh, intrusives? Yeah, yes, no, yes. Some people are born with having uh, both uh, external reproductive organs. Some people are having some reproductive system inside their body, but it is not really uh, clearly appeared externally. Uh, or sometimes uh, something is uh, happening, like uh, somebody's uh, corner systems. So there are many people, actually there are many people who are born as intersex. So it is like, uh, depending on the statistic, but uh, people are saying 0.5 to 1.8% uh, of uh, population are born as intersex. Actually, even those are uh, possibly underrepresented because people are not really making lots of uh, kind of documented about the intersex. So when we say like, okay, say 1.8% of the population, the whole numbers of the intersex population is bigger than the whole population in Russia. The in the number of people were born as intersex. But still in many countries, in many, in most of the states in the United States, uh, there's no option for the intersex people. When you're born, even though you're born as an intersex, they are assigned as male or female. I believe Oregon uh, allow you to be assigned as intersex. Uh, some states in Germany, yes. Poland or Netherlands, yes. But in many countries, most of the countries, most of the states, they do not have uh, those slots. The doc medical doctor can check it. So you will be still, if, even though you were born as intersex, they will be assigned between male or female. How does it sound? So I feel like everyone is familiar with the term gender. So it's, it's like a kind of social component related to the traditional uh, culture associated with somebody's uh, assigned sex or biological sex. Gender identity is about like how you identify yourself in terms of gender. So somebody you identify yourself as male, somebody identify yourself as female, some people identify themselves as between male and female. Okay, I'm somewhere between male and female. But I do not, but some, some people are saying, I do not really want to identify myself as particular gender or something. I'll just go by like um, gender queer, queer or Christian. Uh, for some people are uh, experiencing their gender identities are more fluid. So there's a term uh, which is called gender fluid. So, so they are experiencing some kind of like transitionings or fluidities in their identities, so their feeling and attitude toward themselves in a couple hours sometimes, in days, in one week or something. So, okay, this morning I identify, I feel like I identify more likely a female. But as time goes by, uh, I'm more leaning between somewhere in the evening. I'm more comfortable to identify myself as male. Some people are experiencing their gender identity as a bi gender. So it is a little more like a kind of switching. So, okay, well, I, now I uh, identify myself as male. Oh, now I, I identify myself as female. The so gender fluid, fluid and gen, by gender are similar, but their fluidity is different. Some people identify themselves as, oh, I do not have any gender. Uh, there's a term, agender, for other uh, people. Okay, I do not I I do not identify myself as any kind of gender being. So we call them Asian. Some people uh, identify themselves as androgen or androgenous. I 
identify myself as male and female at the same time. So, so there are lots of uh, gender variances. So, so the term transgender itself is giving you an impression that while well, you still have to be between male and female, and you are kind of transitioning your, or switching your gender, right? So the term transgender is not enough to embrace the all the uh, gender variants. So we started to uh, call them as gender non-confirming people. So I, I believe you guys are familiar with the, trans, the term transgender, right? So somebody's um, gender identity is opposite from their assigned sex. This gender is a person uh, whose assigned sex is corresponding to their gender identities. So for the other gender variant, we, call, we started to call them gender non-conforming. But uh, from like uh, two years ago, uh, people are talking like um, gender non-confirming still gives you an impression that you're not really following the norm. You are not kind of common people. So you, are not, you are kind of out of customs like that. So nowadays, people study to uh, use the term gender expensive than the gender non-confirming. But still, people are using uh, or all of those uh, terms. Some people uh, who identify themselves as genderqueer, but they also identify themselves as transgender, it's okay. Some people um, wanna go by gender non-conforming, some people wanna go by gender expensive, which is fine. But anyhow, in a scholarly term, term we are nowadays, we is like a counselors, are using the terms PGNCE instead of just transgender to embrace uh, people who are in the gender spectrum and all kinds of gender variants. So gender, transgender, gender non-conforming, expensive people. Any questions so far? Okay, and what about these intersex people? What about their gender identity? Well, I think that would determine, like, it would be determined by how they identify. Right, right. It is determined by how they identify. So some people who are born as intersex, they identify themselves as male, female, or sometimes genderqueer. Sometimes they just want to go by, okay, well, I was born in intersex and I identify my gender identity as intersex. So, it is depending on how they identify themselves. Uh, there was a case in South Korea. So there was a guy whose assigned sex was boy, male. He graduated from a um, boys middle school, boys school. He did his uh, mandatory military services. In South Korea, uh, more, uh, most of the male had to serve in the military uh, more than two years by the law, by the law. So he completed his mandatory um, military services as well. He knew that there is some traces in his lower back, just a little bit upper to his, you see, there, there was some trace there. When he went to his doctor's Clinic, doctor's office, well, all the doctors he met told him that, oh, it's just a kind of some uncertain traces, but they assume that it is your, um, maybe something related to your tails one. Okay. Okay. But when he is almost like in his late 20s, he started to bleed once a month from the trace. So now he uh, went to the university hospital. They did the full body scan with him and they found fully run female reproductive systems in his body. And he was able to prove me. So he said, uh, 
finally he could be everything is clear from his confusion after all his life. So now she identified herself as female and she got some uh, medical treatment to uh, reassign her body. She um, fixed the official documentation related to her gender. But what about her parents? They got betrayed, like they feel like being betrayed by their son. They are still thinking that their son made a choice to become a woman. But anyhow, anyhow, it is, it is happening, it is happening. So uh, when somebody was born in a born as a uh, intersex, counselors groups and psychologist groups are recommending them if there's no kind of uh, urgent medical uh, issues, do not uh, make any kind of um, like surgical treatment for these babies, and then and then recommend them to wait till. Uh, they can uh, like uh, present their identities to their parents and others. It is recommendation by made by the counselors and um, psychologists, but I do not know how uh, medical doctors are um, you know, acknowledging about this. So again, again, like um, gender identities as uh, for the intersex people, it is it is about like how. They identify themselves. Uh, let's get, go back to the gender expression. So gender expression is about like, how you uh, present yourself related to your gender. Gender, nowadays, the reason why we uh, separate the gender identity and gender expression is that not everyone uh, Everyone's gender identities and gender expression is kind of um, is the same. And people nowadays, people express uh, their, their gender in many different ways, right? So the gender expression is, is about like, how, it's not just about your kind of um, like appearance. You're like kind of, I mean, your length of your hair, is, and putting on makeup or not, or how do you wear. It is about your attitudes. It is about your kind of voice tone, tone of voice, your way of walking, your body posture, and just, just everything. But when somebody express their gender a little bit more, a little more feminine, it doesn't mean that their gender identity is female. And uh, let's, let's uh, talk about like um, the drag queen. They are the, the performers, the entertainers, these drag queens or drag queens. The drag queens are uh, kind of kind of exaggerating their kind of um, female gender expressions, right? But it doesn't mean that all of the gender, uh, all of the drag queens are like gender queers or their gender identities as female. Some people identify, some drag queens identify themselves as female. Some drug queen identify themselves as gay. It is, it is gay is about like sexual orientation, sexual affection orientations by the way. Some identify themselves male. Some people are saying, uh, it is just my gender expression when I'm performing. Some people are saying, well, I'm having another identity when I'm performing as a uh, drug queen. It is also it is also about how they identify. Does it make sense? Thank you. Thank you. So I like actually I like this uh, yeah. picture. Uh, it is uh, drawn by the uh, Liz Queen. So I have four years old and a child. So you don't really need to. Um, and a be between boy or girl, right? So let's talk about uh, school. Let's talk about school. Is school a safe place for transgender and gender non-conforming expensive students? 
So according to the statistics, definitely not. So 84% 80, of transgender, 60% of gender non-conforming expensive students were bullied for us at school because of their gender identity and expression. By the statistics, uh, overall, 30% of American students are experiencing uh, school bullying or school-related cyber bullying in their life. For the transgender people, 84%. For the gender non-conforming expensive student, 70%. So they are bullied in school. <laughs> it's almost like a hundred percent life, right? 98.5 LGBTQ students per day is a negative remark. 94% of LGBTQ students experience the negative remarks about their gender expressions. 87.4 of LGBTQ students per negative remarks specifically about the transgender people. 70% uh, of them listen to us frequently. 92% felt distressed because of those languages. 62% of them um, listen frequently, like they are not masculine enough, they are not feminine enough. 45.6 are hearing that they're uh, listening to those kind of training or other terms frequently in school. Okay, they are bullied by their peers. What about the other figures in school? Are they supported enough, do you think? Oops. So 56.6% of LGBTQ students report that they are hearing homophobic remarks from their teachers and their school staff members. 71% of transgender and non-conforming expensive students hearing those negative remarks from their teachers and school staff members. They are expected to protect those students. They are expected to advocate for those marginalized students, right? Like you guys are doing. But they are, they are giving those kind of negative remarks to the students. The students do not feel school is safe enough for them. So their dropout rate is higher than their counterparts. They are missing their schools and their classes because school is not a safe place for them. So they're Missing classes, they are getting lots of unexcused absences. It is linked to their graduation rates as well. So, when the students feel that they do not have any supportive auto figure in the school systems, yeah, almost eighty percent of them are saying school is not school is not a safe place. These are for the uh, sexual minority. These are about like uh, gender minority people. So they are missing school in past one month. They are missing schools because eighty percent, only almost eighty percent of them missing school because school is not safe place for them. Well, if they are having one to ten supportive school members, school staff members, teachers, well. Perhaps it's a little bit decline, right? But not that much. They need more supportive adult figures in school. So when they feel that, okay, 11 or more supportive teachers and school staff members in the school, it makes change. Okay, they feel less unsafe about their school systems. They are not uh, miss missing their classes. Well, still, 20% of them are missing their classes because the school is not safe. Mm -hmm. when, we, when they have 11 or more supportive teachers and school staff members. So we need at least 11 people who are advocating, I mean, actively advocating for these students. And maybe we need more to support these students as well. Uh, here's a graph about like um, the safe 
face flicker or like flight uh, flex or those kind of um, symbols. So when the teachers are having those kind of symbols or say about like safe uh, stickers, poster flags, they feel uh, more safe in a school where counselors, school psychologists are having those in that now. They feel the school is, is safer and they feel more comfortable in the school systems. So I usually distribute those uh, stickers to my audiences when I, whenever I'm having those presentations. Right now we cannot, but once everything is under the control and we're able to back to our beautiful stone buildings, please drop by my office and take some stickers from, from my office for me. I have uh, lots of cute stickers related to the like traditional uh, LGBTQ like rainbow flags, some other yeah, flags related to the uh, TGNC students. So you can put those in your laptop or your water bottles in your office and you can show that you are a safe person in your school. So what about the school policies? I'm not talking about like 10 years ago or 20 years ago in this, this um, country. The statistic is from uh, 2018, the national, um, national, uh, national uh, report by the Gleason, uh, who are the uh, school related uh, people's group to support um, gender and sexual minority students. So according to their statistics, well, they, well, they're still discriminated uh, school policies targeted TGNC students. So more than 42% uh, of transgender and non-conforming Spanish students have been pre prevented from using their preferred name and pronouns. More than 46% of them required to use a bathroom by their legal sex. Imagine it, I mean, if you identify yourself female, but you are forced to use male's bathroom and locker room with all the other boys. The school is not a safe place for them. Every, everyone has to go to the bathroom at least like twice a, a day, right? In, in school hours, right? Like, actually, you know what? Many transgender, especially transgender, students who are transitioning who are in the transitioning process, they do not drink water enough because they are afraid of going to the bathroom. They are having those kind of physical health issues because of dehydrating. So more than 46% of them are not allowed to use bathroom by their um, gender identity and locker rooms as well. But if there's some kind of uh, transgender and uh, TGNC student related policies and guidelines made by school, school district counties, or state level, they less likely uh, feel that uh, school is, is kind of like oppressive and dangerous place for them. And they less likely miss their uh, school class. They felt uh, kind of greater belonging to their school communities like that. So they are talking, I mean, TGNCE students are talking that we need more policies or guidelines. I don't think we have uh, time for the discussions, but I will ask those kind of questions to you. I mean, does your school have uh, anti-discriminating policies, including gender identity expressions? If you have, everyone is aware of it, and how does your school let all these members be aware of it? Do the students in your school know what procedures to follow when they feel they are not safe? Does your school has a like, fair process to deal with this, this discrimination? Do your, uh, the faculty members, staff, and all kinds of like uh, staff members, including like, uh, football courts, sports team courts are respecting students' gender identity and their expressions and their comments with respect. 
and your uh, class roster reflecting on their gender identities. What about your school dress code? Like that. So I think everyone uh, needs to think of it. Needs to think of it. Yes, I will test these scenarios. I'm, I was so glad to uh, find uh, this interview. So the Dr. Uh, Kathleen Rogers is an assistant uh, superintendent funding person. And she's also a director of the uh, Department of Prevention and Intervention and Equity in the Leon County. So in the interview, she said, is that, she said, I mean, we should allow them the freedom to use the bathroom that they identify with. So she clearly stated in the interview. So I asked um, Metalika that, oh, is there any, okay, you eat that interview happened in 2016. So now it's 2020. So is there any written policies in Leon County? Metalika, could you answer that? Uh, yeah. There's just uh, some policies regarding anti-discrimination and uh, harassment, but uh, nothing that really addresses some of the other uh, topics you were addressing earlier with regards to uh, using the right pronouns or changing uh, mm -hmm. the names of documents and some of the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm from... Uh, the Washington State, and they are actually they are having very detailed uh, policies and guidelines related to these uh, the advocate for the teaching of these students in the school systems. So they are having a clear guideline about I mean, bathroom use, locker room use, like sports teams, and like everything, like how to support uh, their transitions in the school system like that. She had beautiful statements, and we. Maybe we have some policies which could be applied for this issue, but there's not particular um, guideline and policies, written policies related to support PG and CE students. And there was a loss to happen in um, 2017 in Florida. Uh, he's the boy who went to the uh, into the high school in Florida, and then he uh, was supposed to use gender neutral, neutral bathroom only. So I know some schools are having some gender neutral bathroom, and then they let stu that the TGNC student to use only designated bathroom. And by the um, by the judge, by the judgment, um, it is it is not it is not right. The schools cannot like force the students to use only designated uh, bathroom. They have right to use the bathroom by um, their gender uh, gender identity. So he won. Um, so actually, I want to I want to bring it to some kind of discussion questions. So, what policies do you think we need to develop to support teaching and see advocate for teaching and see students in Florida schools by the school level, county, school district level, and state level? You guys are more expert expert than I am in the school policies, right? What kind of policies can you? Can you imagine? Can you think? Okay, so I actually met that student, Drew, um, because mm -hmm. I am a volunteer for Jasmine, which is the Jack. Jacksonville area sexual minority youth network and he was a speaker yes. at the big symposium and and one of the things that he that he really advocates for but also that glisten advocates for isn't that we should create policies that are more gender inclusive what we should do is remove gender barriers from our policies so rather than having mm -hmm. delineated policy that specifically enables trans students to access mm -hmm 
restroom facilities. We should create restroom mm -hmm. facilities that are not, um, that the, a school policy that says any student may choose the bathroom of their choice or an alternative gender neutral bathroom if they're uncomfortable sharing a bathroom with trans mm -hmm. students even. Um, the idea that a dress code shouldn't say that trans students or gender non-conforming students aren't allowed to or are allowed to wear certain things is less impactful than mm -hmm. a gender neutral dress policy that says what all students mm -hmm. are allowed to wear or not wear. Yeah. It could be, yeah, it, it is it is it is a good progressive policies. Right? What about what about others? Any other thoughts? You guys will be leaders in the Florida school systems, right? What kind of other policies can you propose? I mean, I'm also thinking about the connection between the policy that is at the employment level. So for those faculty and staff that are working in the school systems, you know, where is their, where is that connection to the environment, right? So you could have certain policies that are more inclusive for students, but if those mm -hmm. policies aren't mirrored, I think in the employment practices, it, it seems to be like an imbalanced environment. So I've been thinking a lot more about that, like holistically looking at schools, because you know, so much of it is about, you know, seeing mentors and examples, right? Of the kind of expression and freedom and acceptance. And I just haven't mm -hmm. seen a lot that advocates for both of those things, as opposed to, you know, like one over the other. It's another more, more expert view. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay, I'm going to keep going. I think that one of the most helpful things that a K through 12 school can do is to really encourage um, not just the adoption of a GSA, so a Gay Straight Alliance or a Gender mm -hmm. Sexuality Alliance, but allowing students mm -hmm. to take on a stronger act, um, advocacy role to not just help mm -hmm. to ensure that there are policies that are, like a lot of the policies that are recommended are policies that require an individual student to file a complaint if they feel they've been wronged. But by encouraging mm -hmm. students to be advocates, they help to establish progressive policies that relate more to visibility and being heard. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence that Whenever students are leading the pathway toward progressive policy, just the mere fact that they're being involved in the conversation undoes a lot of the psychological harm of discriminatory um, language and things like that, like biased language that they hear in the hallways. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Krista also mentioned, uh, yeah, even though uh, each and every school should have uh, had discrimination policies, the problem is that the culture of different schools have my progression to counter this policy. Yes, yes, which is true, which is true. But according to the literature, at least having some reading guidelines and reading policies makes some culture, I mean, I mean, makes some differences in culture. And then at least, I mean, you can kind of, um, print those policies or guidelines out and then put it on the, like, uh, the board in the school hallway, that is helping, that is helping. Sometimes, I mean, even though school step members are uh, aware about the uh, students, teaching and see students right to use their bathroom, sometimes, I mean, parents or caregivers of students are making comments when they see that the you know, students are using the bathroom. So, so, like in, so in uh, one school in Washington State, they even just printed out those um, statement. I mean, I mean policies made by the uh, superintendent's group to the right uh, besides the bathroom door. Then every everyone uh, is. I mean, getting into the bathroom can see this. So, so there's a reason why I, I was uh, talking more about like um, still reading policies needed. So these are some kind of, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say in terms of state policy, um, the Florida State Educational Code has a very big section on anti-hate speech directed towards anti-Semitic uh, values. Mm -hmm. And it very, it's very 
clearly lays out the type of language and behavior that is considered actionable. And even though that still puts the burden on the individual to report and to uh, advocate or to sue, um, having that language is a protection to the state and to all the districts that reinforce that policy. And so if you were to mm -hmm. include a similar section for gender identity or for um, protecting students from gender-based bias or harassment, I think that it would really, mm -hmm. um, it would really empower districts because the state is directly behind them uh, and protect the state from right. litigation. Yeah, and we actually we need more uh, clear language stating that like sexual minorities and gender minority students are still are, are I mean need to be protected by this uh, policies and laws, right? I mean, even though I mean there's an anti-bullying um, uh, policies, anti-harassment policies, anti-discrimination policies. Of of course, I mean it needs to embrace all uh, kinds of all kinds of marginalized background. But still, uh, stating like, uh, like um, in not only the cultural ethnicity background, like uh, disabilities, like other minorities status, and uh, sexual and gender minority um, minorities is 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 important. It's, it makes change. Actually, it makes change. It makes difference. So those are some kind of our uh, recommendations. Our means like I and uh, Medulica's recommendation for making more policies in school level. I and mean, at least, if, I mean, even though there's no policies and written policies in county level, state level, school, in the school level, uh, they can make some, they can make some uh, written policies or guidelines. So about like at least their uh, names and pronouns, uh, their accessibility to uh, program activities. Marulika mentioned that um, there's a policies uh, which could be applied or in the Leon County support system, so names, partners, and uniforms and dress codes. And county level could provide some uh, like meaningful family engagement and support systems, and they provide uh, developmental information in the school libraries and faculty resources centers. They could designate a, a kind of specific uh, step members for this. And ad uh, addressing students' uh, traditional uh, needs and how to support them um, by uh, specific uh, procedures. And anti harassment and bullying uh, policies, but well, more designated, like um, embracing um, gender and sexual minority students as well, anti uh, discrimination. Uh, low implemented by the states, name change policies like that, and right to uh, privacy regarding uh, disclosing the student's gender identities. Clearly, uh, saying about the gender identities. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I spend most of the time, but we still have 10 minutes, right? Is there any comments or questions? So I have a question for you. So um, what can a, a teacher, a counselor, or a school leader do in a state where the state governor or legislature is not only not progressive, but actively working in opposition to these kind of policies? Like where there's a, a bathroom, a statewide bathroom law or something like that. Now, what, what can be done at this uh, school in that, those contexts? I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, the, the connection was not clear. Okay, oh, I mean, I'm uh, so, sure. So at the school level, so as a counselor or a teacher, principal, um, in a state mm -hmm. where the state is, um, is not progressive and is actually regressive and is working against these policies, Somewhere like North Carolina, where there's you know bathroom bathroom laws and those kind of things. So, what can be done at the state oh. level to try to protect students from those kind of higher level political things that are going on? That's very tricky one, right? Those very tricky questions, and even like state laws are having um, this, and then 
parents are, are kind of talking about it as well. And then some parents are, I mean, even visiting the school and then they're saying, well, I'm not, I've never allowed, uh, you guys call my son is like this name. You should not, you, have, you must not treat my boy as a girl like that. Uh, I think the, in the, uh, about like school, in regard to school counselors, uh, we have a, uh, clear reading ethical guideline related to that. So according to the guideline, I and mean, we should, we must uh, respect the students' uh, gender identities and their uh, tones. So maybe uh, I, I believe school counselors uh, can advocate for their ethics by using those kind of uh, reading ethical guidelines. So, okay, well, I understand and I understand you are not uh, comfortable to do that, but, but as my professional uh, ethical guideline, I should, I have to. And then maybe they could have like more further session with the parents about like how the parents are dealing with these issues. Uh, maybe school teachers, school teachers and, and principals. I mean, again, I'm not an expert in the like policy, educational policies. But I believe, I mean, they could uh, make some agreements together. They could have some um, conversations together and then make some uh, agreements to support the, uh, like, teaching and CE students. And then being aware of, like, how this kind of violence happen and how do they, those could uh, impact on the students. Even though, I mean, teachers, maybe, maybe teachers are not really aware of, uh, I mean, maybe they are not really fully aware of like, uh, like spectrums and gender identity expressions and their rights, their legal rights or something. I believe, I mean, all teachers, even though, I mean, no matter what, they have like political sense or not or, or, or something. I mean, I believe teachers want to support students and teachers want to protect uh, every student's um, from those kind of uh, violence. So like uh, having a conversation that, okay, like having, I mean, I mean, speaking with like this, this culture, speaking with like this, this policy could be violence for your students, your, your own students who are living in, I mean, staying in the school buildings. It could be a big violence and it could be a risk factor for their graduations and their academic treatment and their um, healthy developments. So, I think at least the yeah, school principals could have this conversation with the teachers and school staff members. Not sure I answered your questions, by the way. Uh, any other questions? Feel free to either ask them or uh, type them if you prefer. Thank you, uh, Michael, about your comments. The language of Title IX should protect all students from discrimination based on their gender. Obama ad administration added guideline. Uh, Trump admin uh, revoked it, um, which is sad to me. Any other thoughts or comments? Questions? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, then please join me in thanking Dr. Yoon for speaking with us today during our R3. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and thank you very much for coming. Thank you for uh, taking your time to be in this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing you around Stone whenever we are all back together again. Yay. Bye, everyone. Bye.